SC joint should be fairly obvious. The way you're going to pick it up is to pick up the sternal notch. You don't push too hard in here because it tends to make it hard to breathe and swallow if you do that, right? <laughs> but the concavity there that you feel just inferior and lateral is going to be the end point of the clavicle. And the way you confirm that you're on it is ask him to lift his arm into abduction. So why don't you go ahead and raise up. And you'll feel the joint pivot a little bit and elevate a little bit. Not a lot of motion going on here. And I think Eric will do a lot better job of isolating as far as the translatory mobilizations of the joint. But you're not going to get a lot of action. So find the notch, come a little bit lateral, and then inferior, and you're going to be right over it, and you can feel it rotate as it goes up again for me. Okay? Conversely, and I'm not going to do this in necessarily the easiest way for me, but so that you can see, is we want to have some understanding of the clavicular arches. Remember, we talked this morning, it's a strut bone. So one of its main purposes is to guide the motion of the, of the scapula, which then positions the scapula appropriately for glenohumeral motion. Okay? So we're going to palpate along its arches. It has to have curve to allow a couple of things. It has to allow protraction and retraction, elevation and depression, and then to some degree that rotary motion. So that's the purpose of, of having the curves. The other thing the curves do are displace forces better than a straight line. The reason bridges have an arch support is that it allows the weight of the car to be distributed across an arch. When you load the shoulder joint, it allows better force distribution than a straight line kind of thing. So palpating the arches, the anterior arch first, typically fairly strong and stable. Most fractures are going to occur at the transition point or distal. And you can feel fractures when you're palpating in this particular bone. A lot of places in the body we can't. So I want you to just palpate along the, the anterior arch and then the posterior arch. As you continue on around, you're going to come to the AC joint. A little hard to palpate, frankly, unless you have a little bit of motion going. Just before the AC joint, he's thin enough that you can see his. See the indentation? So right there at the end of his clavicle, I can confirm where I'm at by having him elevate or go into abduction and I can feel the joint rotation. Same token, we can isolate the end of the clavicle, and he's mobile, actually, he's got a fair amount of motion there. He's mobile enough that I would actually check his other side to see if he had an AC joint injury at some point in time. So there's a fair amount of motion. He's fun to play with. <laughs> <laughs> and this one moves quite freely, too. So a fair amount more distal motion, and there's almost no proximal motion in his particular case. As you go anterior to the acromial arch, you come into the coracoid process. How do you know when you're on the coracoid process? It's going to hurt. It hurts. It does not feel good. It has a fairly large bursa and has three tendons all in place. So when you're on the right spot, you can make yourself sore just by poking on it. The other way to confirm that you're on the biceps is to know which muscles attach there. Everybody got that this morning, I think. Right? Which ones? Short line and biceps. Corcobrachialis and pec minor. So two out of three of those involve elbow flexion. So one way to know that you're on the coracoid process is to resist elbow flexion. Relax. And you'll feel the tendon pop up under your finger if you're on the coracoid. Right? So that's confirmation. You can also have them do pec minor activation, but that's a little bit tougher. So you should know where you're at there. If you can find the end of the AC joint, then you can find the acromion. Lots of stuff go on in the acromion. It's critically important, and he's a wonderful subject to do because he is relatively ectomorphic and bony, and I can just feel the edge of his acromion right down his ball. <laughs> a pencil mark and know exactly where it is. The reason that's interesting for us is that we're going to test his stability in a minute with that sulcus test that you saw this morning and it's going to make him very easy to do. Whereas somebody with really hyper-developed steroid-abusing bicep or deltoids, you're going to have a much harder time getting into that posture. You may actually have to perform a sulcus in order to be able to find where it is. And you can see he's got about a grade two sulcus. Drop it down there. We'll come back to that in just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's an aside. Greater and lesser tuberosities, greater tuberosities,
velocity is the attachment for external rotators. External rotators. So it's going to be in the in the back. You're just going to pick up the um, middle deltoid interval for the posterior deltoid and start working forward along the inferior um, aspect of the acromial arch. And that big bump there is the greater tuberosity. As you move forward, your fingers will drop into a softer area, which is, depending again on size of the deltoid, the bicipital groove, which specifically is covered by the transverse ligament, which stabilizes it. Depending on the thickness and the size of the transverse ligament, you may or may not be able to actually palpate a groove there. One way to know, again, if you're in there, this is long head, just have him flex a little bit at the elbow. And if your finger pops up, then you're on the, on the right spot. you got to be careful, though. If he starts elevating his arm, you're going to feel the deltoid popping up. That's a different tissue. And then right anterior to that is the lesser tuberosity. Okay? Both are involved with impingement tests. And that's why impingement occurs at a little higher angle when those have to go under. Okay, so we did that. Spine of the scapula, T3, I already put it up there. Again, relatively easy for him to see. And also, with all of this, is the inspections. You will see, with particularly nerve injuries, supraspinatus atrophy, infraspinatus atrophy are quite visible um, in the shoulder. Less so, in my opinion, than the teres minor and some of those tissues. So I expect you to kind of be taking a peek at all that. As we have talked about, a little disadvantage doing a whole bunch of normal shoulders um, because, you know, what, is, what does it feel like? What does it look like? I am seeing clinically more nerve involvements. I've had a couple of long thoracic nerve patients this year and a couple of suprascapular notch uh, patients uh, this year, supraspinatus notch, suprascapular notch patients um, already this year. Buddy Savoy out of Tulane is the one writing all of the papers on um, notch injuries, and he's actually scoping the notch now and doing some of the releases, so he's doing some pretty innovative things with that. So we're doing our observations. Find the spine of the scapula. Coming across tells us where we are as far as spinous level. Approximately T3. Right? And then palpating down. You should also at this time be observing scapular position. We didn't get to the scapular um, examination this morning so we're going to pick that up first thing the next time we get, we get together. We're also going to be noticing shoulder position. Right? He's pretty good. More commonly you're going to see a little bit more thoracic kyphosis.